So today I spoke with Christian Gonzalez, who is a contemporary of Coleman Hughes at the Columbia University in New York, and he's also a writer for Quillette. He also writes for the National Review, and he's got some research that he's done into intersectionality, and so he's given me a very concise explanation of intersectionality, and we, we talk about the ways that it operates and kind of its strengths and its weaknesses and how it's kind of uh, running public discourse, especially in op-ed activism. So I hope you guys enjoy this. And the deer do too. It's blackberry season. Did you know that? You probably knew that. You just recently wrote a review on a book uh, called Intersectionality, an academic book. Right. And you, you took a pretty strong stance against intersectionality by saying that it's, um, by saying a number of things. I can't recall them all. Maybe we could, you can start talking about that um, or flesh it out. But I wonder what prompted you to look into intersectionality and to have a kind of strong contra position against it. Yeah, well, speaking of events happening around me, uh, the way I see it, um, and this might be controversial, but my perception is that every time some sort of controversy arises regarding free speech on campus or regarding some sort of person being fired or not fired from a newspaper for having X or Y view uh, or some sort of racial incident that, that the country is obsessed with for three days yeah. uh, until the next one comes along almost invariably the people on the left who are c making a fuss of uh, of it I, I don't mean to make lightly of it but are mm -hmm. causing whatever the controversy is uh can always be perceived to be functioning under intersectional theory if you listen to what they say and and so because of that because i heard now, uh, sometimes explicitly stated and sometimes just sort of assumed um, people on the left sort of functioning when it comes to race and gender politics under intersectional principles. So I wanted to dive into this book and see what it's all about. And I disagreed with it strongly, but mm -hmm. I, it, it, I think it is a formidable theory that needs to be confronted. Can you... Uh break down what the intersectional principles are like in like a couple of axiomatic principles yeah so and if i start not making sense just interrupt me to okay. specify or clarify something Absolutely. but they're so they're big the intersectional theorists have their project is twofold they want to do they want to understand social inequality yeah. So why is it that men and women are different in society? Why is it that there are more men uh, in positions of power, like in Congress, for example? Uh, why is it that blacks are underrepresented in certain areas of society and overrepresented in others? Um, and finally, they want to understand class distinctions. So those are the big three. They want to understand race, class, and gender differences. There are other differences that they're interested in, but those are the, the main three. And secondly, hmm. they want to criticize these differences and change them. So having understood why it is that men and women are different, blacks and whites, etc., uh, differ, they want to change it because they think that the people at the bottom of the hierarchy, so women or, or blacks, etc., are being oppressed by the system, and so they want to overturn it. Hmm. I think that's that's a outline. Um, and by overturn, you mean overturn, not refine the system, but overturn the system. Do you think that there's a thread of like a revolution of just tearing and dismantling structures? Yeah, absolutely. They it is very revolutionary. I mean, I've never seen them call for a sort of Bolshevik violent type of of revolution, but. But they do think that the whole system is rotten, that uh, hmm. that white supremacy, that patriarchy, mm -hmm. that hmm. oppressive uh, class, um, that class oppression is baked into our entire society, the laws, the culture, etc. And so they want they it's a ruthless critique of it and they want to get rid of it.
hmm. specifically. I, I I don't think they. I mean, they have some general principles, but they don't. Ha- they they don't never quite articulate what their perfect race, non-racist, non-sexist utopia would be like. But that's a long, long been a problem for the far well, left. The the thing that I see happening is that in the absence of a solution, they end up being more and more classist, racist, and sexist, just against the the dominant or wh- whoever they construe as the dominant mm. paradigm uh, such as i mean i was just reading an article in the guardian which is i think uk based and they have a weekly article called uh, this week in patriarchy which is a feminist it's about <laughs> feminism but they they define it all as against their enemy right and i'm sure that mm. there's a this week in white supremacy article out there somewhere <laughs> where it's about nominally it's about equality of race but in the absence of it maybe i'm shooting from the hip here but in the absence of a solution they end up you know just being engorged with againstness because they don't have anything that they're working for Hmm. well so the sophisticated intersectional thinkers would probably insist that their problem is with the system Mm -hmm. so it's with white supremacy not necessarily with whites Mm -hmm. um but in practice, how that manifests itself is often uh, people um, just railing against whites or having this sort of resentment uh, toward whites rather yeah. than uh, the white supremacy. And I wonder if that resentment is, uh, if they're catching on to the resentment and starting to criticize the resentment uh, within their intersectional circles or not, because it, it, uh, what I see happening is that there all this intersectional theory, uh, it started in the academy as theory based on like a certain sort of, uh, sociological kind of framework. Um, but then it starts to trickle down into our media, uh, specifically through publishing, uh, mostly through publishing, but also any given media. So now it's surfacing, uh, it, it seems like in a way, over the past uh, three or four years, there's this, this huge outbreak of intersectional theory being implemented in op-ed pages, most mostly. And then in the publishing practices of, you know, you can go through comics and you can go through uh, what's happening in the gamosphere. And you can also see that in actual book publishing, where now there's these things called sensitivity readers who go through and make sure that if you wrote about a character whose culture you weren't born into, that mm-hmm. you're, you know, you, you, you're doing it correctly, you know, which is quite Orwellian in a way. Yeah, uh, well, I'm I'm not very familiar with the game meme sphere, uh, so you could talk about that because I don't know too much about it. But certainly in in media, in mm-hmm. all sorts of media, from like you say, book publishing and and the major newspapers. I mean, it's really astonishing the sway that intersectional theory has. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm not I'm not sure. I don't want to sound conspiratorial, but I'm not sure that. Uh, oh, you know, someone who isn't part, like you say, someone who isn't part of, of a certain culture can write fiction about another culture anymore uh, mm. without being just bombarded with, um, you know, criticism for being otherizing or racist or, mm-hmm. or what have you. Mm-hmm. So it, it certainly, it, it's funny because they, they always talk about, intersectional theorists always talk about the power of structures to, to sway human behavior, mm-hmm. structures, you know, white supremacy and the rest. But I mean, just the, their ideas have have an enormous influence on, on media. It, mm-hmm. The sheer power of their ideas and, and how people respond to them. Yeah. Do you do you find that looking? At, you have a problem with it. Yes. Right. <laughs> uh, I mean, because you're critical of it. But do you see um, particular weaknesses that it has? Um, one in its core. Could you talk about the core weaknesses of it? And then, like, what are the weaknesses to you know? eradicate it or uh, Hmm. to diminish its power so to do that uh, I can talk about the weaknesses but let me lay out their conception of race gender and class their analysis of it Mm -hmm. and then I could come back and say where I think they go wrong is that fair yeah so intersectionality combines insights on gender theory or from gender theory, from critical race theory, and from just pretty standard Marxist class analysis. Mm-hmm. So, 
first with gender, the, their essential insight is that gender is a social construct and that there are no differences between men and women that are innate or, or eternal or uh, what have you. Mm -hmm. And furthermore, that gender is constructed to oppress women and so they need to be liberated. With race, the essential insight is, uh, as I mentioned before, that our, uh, the, the oppression of minorities is baked into everything in our society, from laws to culture to media, etc. And then the class aspect is that, you know, because there are people who own factories and industries, workers will always be screwed because they will uh, be unequal and not have power and, uh, and be suppressed. Mm -hmm. So intersectionality gets those three and it combines them and discusses how they overlap. Mm -hmm. So if you are a black poor woman, you aren't only oppressed because of your race or your gender, but you, you have a sort of mm -hmm. overwhelming oppression because of all these different axes. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, okay. So that that's, that's intersectionality. So, so here, there are a few problems with it, with this, and I'll start with the gender issue. Intersectional theorists, I, I've never seen them talk about, and, and the feminists you see in, in papers like The Guardian, they are hostile to the idea that there are innate biological differences between men and women, and that these differences necessarily constrain the way our society is going to look. So. According to them, if only our culture changed the way it perceived women hmm. and thought of them and wrote about them and hmm. treated them legally and so on, then the women would be equally, if not more, represented in Congress, in uh, what have you, in high posi positions of high attainment. Hmm. However, I think this, uh, this view just totally overlooks uh, insights that we know from, from psychology. Um, hmm. And, light, and pretends that all our hundreds of thousands of years of evolution left us with no differences between men and women, even though we know that the evolutionary pressures exerted on men and women were different. Um, that natural selection selected for certain types of men and certain types of women, which is why, for instance, men are stronger and taller on average. Of course, mm -hmm. there are exceptions. Um, so I think any analysis of gender politics that doesn't take into account the ways that men and women are intractably different is bound to, to fail. And moreover, to, just to take the strength one, well, not to get into cognitive differences, which are even more controversial, but hmm. th there are some feminists who deny that men are stronger or taller on average. Um, I have seen that. I don't know if all of them would, but, but I have seen the argument be made. <laughs> um, but, but, you know, I, for instance, I don't think society would benefit from having a 50-50 split in lumberjacks or in mm. oil rig workers. And if women or in don't daycare want, workers, yeah. Or in daycare workers. And if women don't want to be, don't want to work in oil rigs, I, I, don't, I don't think we should necessarily encourage them to. Of course, we, if they do want to be an oil rig worker, we shouldn't say, no, you can't do it because you're a woman. So long as she's strong and capable, she should certainly be allowed to. Mm -hmm. but, but when I see that, you know, 90% of oil rig workers are men. I don't find that objectionable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they, 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 only, they only fight for positions of high status, basically. Th that's the only thing I've seen from the intersectional feminists. They're, they're fighting for positions of high status. They're always talking about, uh, you know, why aren't there more representatives of Congress, more CEOs, right? They don't, they don't talk about the bricklayer. They talk about the, the guy who gets all the attention, right? And then they, they, usually they overlook like the 80 hours a week that this person works to, right. to, to, to achieve that goal. And I wonder, I wonder if you think, uh, I want to ask you if you think that they avoid, by and large, uh, this is probably a faulty way of thinking, but do you, do you think that psychology and evolutionary biology is avoided because it becomes too complex and it, it starts to disturb the theory and the theory starts breaking down when you accept that sort of data in it or or is there something uh, you know hostile that they find um, within the, the science and, and the the methodology of those two disciplines well that would have to that would be psychoanalyzing them a bit yeah but, okay um, but I think I, one could fairly speculate because 
the truth of the matter is that the fact of men and women being different in certain ways does prevent a 50 50 equalization across all of society hmm. and that goes against what they would like to see because so long as men and women are different then the feminist utopia of of total equality across all sectors of society can't be achieved so they mm -hmm. it would be very inconvenient of them to take into account biology yeah 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 and um so we were, we were just talking about gender and mm -hmm. then there's two other basic uh, categories being uh, class and race. Uh, and then, yeah. so right now we see a lot of problems going around with the differences in races. And it's, I don't necessarily want to get in that hot, you know, that hot water, but it seems like you could analyze races physicality and be okay with like races having different physical attributes but once you get into cognitive a attributes people go haywire if you start to discuss like the patterns or the mm. you know the, the differences uh which i don't think are that large but there are some differences in in races when it comes to cognitive ability as well as physical ability um but even entering into that discussion seems like they, they've effectively shut off that discussion by casting anybody who enters into the uh, the position that yes there are cognitive differences between the races um, is automatically on the road if not already a, a white supremacist mm. or is a supremacist for wh whichever race has the highest IQ. Mm. So when we get into analyzing any differences with race and gender, um, that starts to disturb the outcome orientation of the intersectionalist. Yes, uh, although I I know what you refer to when it comes to race, but I would not appeal to biology to explain differences in outcomes between races. I just mm. don't think it's necessary. Mm. Uh, I think there's a strong argument to be made that we shouldn't talk about, you know, the sort of things Charles Murray talks about in okay. the bell. Um, but I would prefer to skirt around that because yeah. I, I don't find it necessary and it's very complex. And one can understand why there are differences in outcomes between ethnic groups just by purely looking at other factors not related to biology. Okay. And uh, I, I think that is a, a better, a much better thing to do. And, and by ethnic groups, you're including culture or you're making more of a cultural um, yes. Yes. viewpoint or argument. Right. Yes, definitely. And and so certain cultures have a diff uh, different cultures have different outcomes with regards to uh, I guess financial uh, uh, scholarship, uh, probably uh, where the people start to end up working, and how probably even in their ratio of breeding and uh, stuff like that. Um, but the intersectionalist wants to equalize all the outcomes across ethnicities. It seems to me that they uh, they make the they make the crucial mistake that yeah. Thomas Sowell, the economist, great intellectual Thomas Sowell, uh, has refuted, which is that they they the intersectional theorists think that the reason why there are differences in outcomes, you know, educationally, income wise, etc., mm -hmm. between different cultural groups, uh, Hispanics, Blacks, Asians, etc is because of some structure that discriminates against them. Mm -hmm. And Sol shows empirically, I think conclusively, that even if there were no if there was no discrimination, even if everybody, every single human being had absolutely no prejudice against anyone else, there still would be differences between the groups uh, because of a whole range of a whole a whole host of other factors. Um, for just to give one example, taking America groups in America are not equally distributed uh, geographically mm. so there are concentrations of Asians in certain uh, parts of the country of Hispanics uh, I live in Miami there are many Hispanics here in mm. Wyoming I suspect there are not many uh, uh, and so uh, geographic regions vary by how wealthy they are so if you have an ethnic group that is uh, that disproportionately lives in a wealthy or poor area of the country, then their aggregate 
in, uh, income levels are going to be different from other groups that live in, in other areas of the And how people end up in a certain area, I mean, it, it isn't entirely decided by, um, hmm. by structural uh, factors. Uh, people migrate into cities where they have family networks, for example. So that, that right there is just one factor that prevents there being a totally equal yeah. uh, plane among different groups. It seems like the tendency of intersectionalism, at least op-ed intersectionalism, is to call upon the people with wealth to divest themselves of wealth, the people with privilege to divest themselves of privilege. It, the onus tends to always be put upon the person who is seen to be at the top of the hierarchy to lift up or to, uh, to step aside so that the people on the bottom of the hierarchy can somehow just all, all of a sudden get to the top of the hierarchy but it seems the the problem that I have with that is that take for instance if you want to be a successful businessman you need to learn how to manage money and manage time and instead of like high, uh, underscoring uh, you know time management just boring skills boring life skills instead of saying like everybody needs to have these you know and, and getting into education which I think is the, the solution but it goes even prior to education um, Instead of like promoting solutions that would uh, empower people on the individual level, it seems that the intersectionalist uh, wants to blame everything on the structure, right? And then what that ends up doing is providing the people who are on the lower rungs of society to divest themselves of responsibility for climbing up by just saying that they're constantly oppressed. And I see that when intersectionality kind of lands in the hands of the populace, they end up uh, they end up using it as a tool to shut down argument and to excuse themselves of the very, you know, core abilities that would allow them to uh, climb the wrong by because if they use intersectionality, they get a bunch of internet points, they get a bunch of so social status, but that doesn't translate into monetary power or actual social status, just a surface level social status. Do you find that yeah. a fair critique? Uh, I would I would say so. They do. There is a strain of of uh, intersection uh, intersectional theorists who look at who would prefer that uh, if you are a member of a dominant group in a position of power that you defer in some ways to to uh, upcoming individuals who are members of not uh, the dominant group. Mm -hmm. um, so there is some of that, and there is certainly some shutting down of of, of debate if if you are. Uh, a member of a dominant group disagreeing with someone of a, of a not dominant group. Mm -hmm. um, but there's also uh, another strain within intersectional theory uh, that you find is a is a sort of skepticism of 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 our what they would describe as our standards of competence. Mm -hmm. So when they when they look at achievement, uh, say in in school or in in business, there's a, cer a certain skepticism of how much that actually reflects achievement or how much it reflects white male bourgeois values mm -hmm. um, in their view. They think that the way our society is structured is designed to benefit white, you know, white property men. Mm -hmm. And so when you, when you talk about, well, shouldn't we be teaching people to be successful businessmen and leaders? They would say that you have to be careful with that because uh, you're, upholding the yeah. white supremacist way lens of the world well but where does that where does that actually I mean, I, I just, how does that translate into like being competent at Excel? If you don't teach people to be competent at Excel because Excel is somehow like in, uh, in, Inissimally, um white supremacist in and of itself uh, then it <laughs> translates into people not like getting accountant degrees the same thing with coding if you want more people of a diverse you know coding structure they have to learn to code and if code yeah. is somehow in and itself uh, you know classist or racist then you're giving people the a disincentive on a moral or like a emotional level a disincentive to engage with just the very you know uh, difficult uh, structures of algorithms and and you know different languages and stuff like that. So it seems like they're in effect shooting people in the foot that they're trying to help. 
And and it goes back to me like, well, are the, is it just virtue signaling? Is it just is this just a really efficient way of gaining social capital without actually helping people? Um, maybe that I, I agree totally with you about what you say. I mean, I, either one can read and write competently, or one can't. Hmm. Either one can do math and learn algebra. Or one can't. Sorry, I, I might, might have heard my dog. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but but these skills are real skills that you need in life, and they are not the product of white supremacy. You know, algebra is not white supremacist in my, in my view. So so I, I agree with you. Hmm. Um, is it just virtue signaling? I don't know. I I think lots of people genuinely believe it. Hmm. Uh, they genuinely think that they are helping women, minorities, uh, etc. When they say the sorts of things that they do, when uh, so, I think part of it is genuine. I also think part of it is is uh, genuine uh, resentment that you sometimes see against mm. against the dominant groups. Yeah, genuine resentment. That that's a what. What do you think about that? What. How does how does a society deal with resentment, and how do we how do we provide forums where that can be worked out, and that there is a terminus, like it's not just fostering it, but airing it out, and then going through a process of of uh, you know, re restoration. Gee, uh, that's, a, that's a tough question. Um, I think one uh, maybe this is very optimistic of me, but one should be empirical in the claims that one makes. So, for instance. Feminists are uh, very upset when they see, uh, for example, uh, the gender pay gap. Yeah. So they look at it and they, they see, look, women are getting screwed over because they're doing the same work as men and getting paid however, 20 cents less than, than they are for the mm -hmm. same job. Right? And that, that if that was true, it would be cause for resentment. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, if you were a woman or even if you were a man, you should still be angry. Uh, that a woman doing the same job as you is getting paid less. Mm -hmm. But when you actually look at the data, those figures turn out not to be true. And so the reason for their resentment is is, is, is destroyed. Mm. So, so I think it helps to always have an empirical grounding. Mm -hmm. But I don't think that entirely gets you there. Mm -hmm. So to be skeptical of my of, of what I just said, I mean, there was, a, there was an op-ed in the Washington Post a few weeks, maybe months ago, um, and t titled, Why Shouldn't We Hate Men or Why Can't We Hate Men? Yeah. I don't know yeah. if you saw it. Yeah. And the, the woman who wrote it who, uh, was a professor at uh, some university, maybe Northwestern, Northeastern. Yeah. I forgot her name. And her argument was, well, you men have done all these long, have committed these long, this long list of crimes against us women throughout all of human history, so why shouldn't we, we be furious? with you mm -hmm. i mean if you're going to be upset at the barbaric the, and barbaric things were done to women from what for much of human history uh if you're going to be upset at that and translate it to an anger today i, I don't really think there's anything i can do to mm. not make about it. it it's just it can't be done well so the problem with that is well that needs to be attacked because if you have a growing uh contingent of the population that's just resentful for history it, mm. uh, that's just unbridled and there's no way to change that other than just i mean the 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 solution that the woman who wrote that article was that it's time for men to step aside and men yeah. to be quiet like that's just basically <laughs> it's not solving oppression it's basically just reversing oppression and it's like it's our turn to oppress you or it, you know that's a subtext but it's our turn to have power right and and the other problem i have with that uh, argument of like and, and no it's true like women historically speaking uh the the second sex by simone de bois was very eye-opening for me uh to to look at like how um misogyny is baked in a lot of of culture but at the same time, you could say, well, men invented, you know, roads and, you know, science and uh, antibiotics. And like, there's been progress 
uh, and, and a decrease of suffering that you could also, you know, say that men had some part in, you know, helping society get better now. Uh, so it just seems like what, what is the counter to th that call out? And, and again, I think she was just doing this op-ed feminism, op-ed intersectionality stuff. It's like, what is the counter to that? How, how do we, you know, call it out for what it is, which I think is just unrestrained resentment. It's, it's petty and it's just going to poison our culture. It, it is poisoning our culture. Yeah. Well, one of the things you touched on there was the way she interpreted history is very bizarre. If, if you stop to think about it, because she says, look at all these things that men did to women. So here's why I'm angry. Hmm. But you imagine how weird it was to, um, if someone wrote the opposite of pad, why can't we love men? and said, look at all these wonderful things I've done, they built, men have done, they built the Colosseum, they, you know, I mean, it, it would be strange. But, I mean, obviously men, like women, have done great things and have done awful things. And it, it, it seems strange to go back through history and dig for uh, things to be resentful about when you, mm -hmm. the logic of it is shaky at best. Mm -hmm. You bring up a good point. Like, why is it? Why is it kind of like the the trend right now, or why is it okay right now for every week a new, very kind of very strong anti anti male uh, opinion piece is published in a in a major newspaper? Every week something new is going on. I, I wonder. I know. I skeptically, I know it's about views, but at the same time, like, why is that? okay and and is not intersectionality kind of responsible for allowing that to be the case where there's just constant resentment and constant hammering on certain social classes i think intersectionality is partly uh, at fault um if you think you know all the, that all the oppressions i mentioned earlier exist then you know you're going to behave in a way that reflects it and you're going to be resentful um there's there's another reason i don't know there was an article in the Atlantic by Raihan Salam. Um, I don't know if you have to see it, but Raihan Salam is a, is a writer at National Review. And his argument was that the reason why you see so many of these op-eds railing against men or against white people is because in progressive social circles, it gives you sort of social capital hmm. uh, and it makes you popular to sound off against the evils of, of, of white men mm -hmm. and it, it's a way for for progressives to gain acceptance into them and i think that it's a solid thesis yeah there was that i th i heard that interpretation with sarah Zhang, who is yeah. she was recently hired to the new york times and like there's years and years and years of her uh tweets came out which are just blatantly anti-white anti-man anti-white man uh and it somebody made the critique that the way for her to become a part of the dominant class she needs to hate the dominant class to be accepted <laughs> into that there's there's some sort of in order to get acceptance into this very you know this very uh elite uh, circle, you need to bash on that elite circle. And that what does that say about that elite circle is that it's using gender and, uh, and race to cover up the fact that it has all the social capital, that it itself is the aristocracy and it doesn't want, it would rather have people fighting am amongst itself over these characteristics rather than aiming at class. And why do you think that class is the one thing that's been dropped by and large from a lot of these conversations? Uh, uh, well, that's a good question, and, and there's a there's a ferocious debate on the left about about the role that class should play mm -hmm. in in this politics, and so the the more traditional sort of Marxist socialist left looks at intersectionalities of, of what they call obsession with race, and it, and is very critical, and it says, look, we socialists are also anti-racists, but the only way to get rid of this oppression is is through class struggle, not through whatever you intersectional people are doing. Mm -hmm. um, why has it been dropped? It's is a good it, question. I'm not sure I have a very good answer. It's just not sexy? Or? It's not It's not as sexy. I suspect also, I mean, the people who are intersectional theorists, just a sociological point, um, are very often, I mean, they'll be, very often they are people of color or uh, women, but, but they're incredibly 
privileged positions. I mean, Sarah Young, whom you mentioned, is going to be, she went to Harvard Law, and she's going to be a uh, a member of the New York Times editorial board, Mm -hmm. and she's 30 years old. I mean, in no serious, discernible way is is she oppressed by anyone or anything. She is one of the most, one of the luckiest people ever to have lived on this planet. Hmm. And class, uh, I think it would be, maybe, maybe there is something to the notion that because these people tend to be very privileged, they are a bit scared of talking about class. I suspect that might be some of it, but... Mm-hmm. But I, I don't have a. Yeah. I, I would also I would add I would add one thing. A lot of the intersectional theorists I've read also do believe very passionately that race is the it's the number one axis of oppression. It matters. You're much more oppressed as a black person than you are as a poor person or as a woman. Mm. So that that's a sincere belief on their part. I, I don't think it's true, but but. I, that might be part of it also why class sort of gets demoted it, it seems like it, uh that's a very very powerful idea and i i've seen i've seen that firsthand at evergreen state college where that where race became cent- central and the oppression of of black people was used to give black people unfettered power just based on their skin color they were given unfettered power and everybody else became uh you know basically servants and bowed down before them and followed them uh and and i see that that idea um that it doesn't work out because it it actually it caused those people who acted that way to make utter fools of themselves (laughs) and probably set back the actual progress of our culture towards, uh, you know, like uh, seeing beyond race, it probably set us back another few years. Um, mm. So it, it seemed, and it, and it seemed in part because they had loosed themselves from the necessity of basic communication skills, basic logic skills, basic just looking into the future, uh, thinking about how other people will perceive me. Like the actual skills that would make them successful were set aside for characteristics so so competency uh i there's there's a formulation i put like empowerment without etiquette is just a license to be an asshole and that's exactly what what happened um so again it seems that there's a huge flaw in the intersectional um ideology if it um if it denigrates the need for certain principles that are you know social principles that are benefit beneficial social principles just hard work and you know found everything on hard work communication and then other things on top of that yeah but again they would uh many of them um and again when i say many of them for all of these things i'm not inventing what they say or or caricaturing them these are Mm -hmm. all things that, that that i've seen them write and say but but many of them would would deride all the things you've mentioned as so so the politics of civility they would deride as racist yeah, yeah. As helping to uphold the system yeah. and, and and so on so it's a huge issue um it's no, a huge I, issue they active because- they actively went after civility like the teachers yeah. and the people who were doing the orientations like try to mm. you know problematize civility and then what do you have when you let that go right right Glenn Lowry, uh, do you know you know Glenn Lowry's uh, podcast with yeah. John McClure? Great podcast. Yes. <laughs> At one point, Glenn Lowry um, said, you know, uh, when these people deride uh, respectability, it's like, and who would want to be respectable? Like, as if that's what as if that was such an awful thing. Well, it, that plays again into like this odd uh, suppression of class because one of the things that you know is kind of uh, at least uh, associatively metaphorically wed to uh, having financial capital is being classy is is manners and stuff like that. So that's another thing that's that's oddly uh, kind of overlooked. 
or mm. or kind of uh, attacked in a, in a weird way and i can see how you know uh, the the critique of white culture as like being stiff and like something stuck up your butt and being kind of judgmental and uh, you know not having a lot of rhythm and and uh i, I can see that uh, critique like in a good natured cultural critique where like you know if you look at white culture or anglo-saxon culture or the wasp culture like there's certain like things about it that are just kind of you know silly and that we can mock and stuff but um it seems like that's been weaponized to a certain extent that it's actually hurting the people who are trying to make a difference in the world because they're they're turning off a lot of people a lot of disadvantaged yeah. people i mean what yeah and i mean what do we have in the absence of civility just yelling at each other and hoping that you'll get your way it seems like an awful way to conduct and press your demands. Well, it's it comes down like when I analyze Evergreen, it comes down to the person with the most charisma wins, and the person with the strongest oppression wins. But they win, and then they completely uh, make huge mistakes and they completely fail because they don't have the skills to know what to do when they're given all this power it's like okay mm -hmm. you won the power what are you going to do with the power but and that's why I, I wonder what is the what's the flip coin like if intersectionality does it have a solution or is it just a criticism is it the first half of like is it the first movement and will it be able to translate into something that starts to provide solutions other than berating people on on social media I don't think they have an ultimate solution because their vision of a, of a perfectly equal race, gender, class world can't happen ever. And, and so they will be forever pressing demands that just cannot be fulfilled. Hmm. So I, I don't think there, there can be an end game. Mm -hmm. what's, the, what's your alternative to uh, intersectionality? What do you think the alternative is? So... You know, I, um, you'll, I'm sorry for the shameless self-promotion here, but <laughs> I, I wrote an article in National Review oh, cool. um, yeah, a, a few months ago, and I see the intellectual dark web, which I'll define a bit more rigorously, but let me just finish this thought, yeah. um, as a sort of response to intersectionality. Uh, so let me be clear. That's not all they are hmm. uh, by any means, and they're a very diverse group of people um, so the Weinsteins who were at Evergreen are describe themselves as being on the left, mm -hmm. uh, but then Ben Shapiro is on the right, for example. So, so they're very diverse ideologically, but they all share, at least I argue, they all share a rejection of the intersectional view of inequality. Mm. For all of them, when they look at men and women, they can see, look, it, it it probably there is sexism, and there are or there could be some structural barriers that we should take down. But men and women are different, and they're never going to be equal. That and that belief is pretty much shared all across the intellectual hmm. dark. Hmm. Um, similarly, with race, there's a, a spectrum, but many of them uh, of the inter of the intellectual dark web types understand that the reason why groups vary isn't only because of oppression and racism mm -hmm. and and so I, I i think the intellectual dark web is is an empirical counter argument to intersectionality mm -hmm. that, that i hope can be successful and uh certainly it's gained a lot of traction so so one maybe could be a little bit optimistic could you uh you promised that you'd uh, be more rigorous in the definition of it and you've given some uh mm. some qualities of it but what are what would be the the core concepts or principles uh so well yeah but, so there's not much and one kind of has to tease it out from mm. viewing the figures are and and kind of piecing it together like a puzzle certainly almost everyone in the intellectual dark web has been at the receiving end of a social justice assault on their scholarship. Hmm. Uh, so they are treated with hostility by the, the intersection of the left for, you know, talking about gender differences or talking in a heterodox way about um, hmm. racial disparities. So there's that. Um, and and, and and like I said, they also share. They're all very pro free speech and academic freedom. Mm -hmm. 
and they all share this view that I've tried to articulate regarding inequality and and maybe it, I think it does help to name some of the people I'm thinking of just so that you could kind of you know conceptualize it but I think Glenn Lowry and John McCorder certainly, oh, yeah. and Christina Hoff Summers mm -hmm. Steve Pinker um, diverse politically but all have a very empirical commitment to figuring out hmm. why there are inequalities in society hmm. Hmm. and why do you think that these this group and not just the group itself but the individuals in this group what is there a, a theme on why they get such hostile treatment from the uh, intersectional uh, media and, and fellow academics uh, well there the intersectional left is um, speaking of people who are who are black and in the intellectual dark web is is very hostile to uh, minority individuals who hmm. voice the type of views that I'm voicing. So my, my friend whom you've interviewed, Coleman Hughes, hmm. uh, for example, got, got a lot of hate on Twitter for daring to challenge the sort of intersectional orthodoxy on race. And it was especially pronounced because he himself is black. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and the intersectional types um, really don't like that. Um, that's hmm. part of it. And part of it is also, I mean, in a way, the research of people like Christina Hoff Summers, Steve Pinker, does get in the way of, a, of the intersectionalist's egalitarian project. Hmm. And so if someone is bringing up a strongly researched empirical answer to your project that debunks it, you are going to be very hostile to that person. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. What You brought up this term individual maybe we both brought it up but um and and what i've heard are you from the intersectionalists is that uh, the they they bag on the people who call themselves individualists because they they believe that there is no individual that can be divorced from their identity from their social mm -hmm. identity and it seems to be and then the 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 argument against intersectionalists is to call them you know tribalistic or there's another term uh, sleeping uh, slipping uh, from but it seems like at once they think that everything's a social construct even the even the self the self inherently is a, is a social construct and it seems for me my project is or what what sets me against them is that no the 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 individual is the only thing real everything else is subsequent everything all identity is is secondary to the individual and i've been you know i've been argued against that well the only reason you think that is because you're a white male of course you can <laughs> your your identity is invisible because you see it everywhere um or it's invisible to me because i'm immersed in it and and so i understand that to a certain extent I am privileged uh, that I do have a lot of capital that that my masculinity opens doors for me that my whiteness opens doors for me uh, directly just even on the internet on, on YouTube like I, I have a large you know I, I meet a lot of people or people look at me because I, I fit in this box you know and then they start listening to me because of just like my identity because mm. I, I present my identity. But, uh, and I wonder what, what you think about the tensions between identity and the individual and what you think is central and, and what are their relationship? Um, that, that's a tough one. Um, well, to start, I don't think anyone is the sum total of all your identity groups. Mm. Um, so you can't just add white, male, rich, able-bodied, and, and so on, and then equals your mm. individual self, because that just erases your agency. Yeah. And you become a sort of machine yeah. that is just programmed with all these things. And it, one of the things that I've never seen intersectional theorists give a persuasive answer to is how, if people are the product of their identity, how then can there be so much ideological um, and viewpoint differences among, you know, these different groups? Hmm. So it just simply is not the case that um, all black people think the same way, all white people think the same way, and it's absurd to say so. And it's obvious. Um, hmm. 
so so for, for instance um, something that Coleman my friend um, called my attention to one day is that 90 percent of Native Americans don't find the uh, Washington Redskins name offensive 90 <laughs> percent right now this statistic is something that should just explode the mind of an intersectional theorist <laughs> because if you know if Native peoples if their whole system of reality was contingent on their being native, then yeah. according to the intersectional theorists, this should be totally offensive to them, and it isn't. Well, and, this, so, and this is where intersectionality, like or intersectionalists, really show their cards by how patronizing they are by by saying, "Oh, well, you just don't know better." Like the, right. it's it's implicit in you; you don't know any better. And it, then they, yeah, the, their argument is, "Well, that's an internalized racism, internalized sex, which is supremely patronizing, and it could." Contrary to what they say, it could just be the result of someone thinking things through, hmm. not thinking, well, I'm white, so I have to think this, but rather thinking, what, what are, why should I think a certain way? And then arriving at a conclusion that doesn't part from his skin color. So... Yeah, I wonder. I wonder if they hyphenate. I always use the word hyphenate, and I mean italicize. Or I wonder <laughs> if they stress uh, the identity is because their their entire pol their entire politics, and which means to say their entire path toward victory, which goes to say their way towards power is by binding people into groups, is into collectivizing people. And you collectivize according to identity, and that identity is bound together with oppression, which I think is so corrosive to the individual to see that your identity is, is oppression. Like, you eventually equate yourself with oppression and that your oppression becomes the, the you know the center of the of yourself the center of your organization and then the center of the whole world is oppression and and, and rather than diminishing oppression it what that does is it 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 brings it uh, strong it makes it stronger and stronger and stronger like an idol it becomes like an idol like everybody starts to mm. praise it even though they're it's an, it's a negative attention but they're still giving their attention and their their worship you know to to this idol of oppression and that's that's why i think on a, on a psychological metaphorical spiritual level it's it's corrupt that's that's my take mm. on it yeah it, they, they do they encourage people uh of, of minority groups to feel oppressed for in, in the universities um so at columbia for example where i study mm -hmm. the, there are all sorts of different programs designed to help uh, students of color and women advance mm -hmm. at, at least that's what at least that's how they're presented yeah um and but there are, there's also an implicit sometimes explicit encouragement of okay you're a member of this identity group you should feel oppressed because you are and you need to organize politically around your identity to press your demands, mm -hmm. and, and, and that is yeah. that is a very corrosive thing to to tell students that they are oppressed when they aren't, mm -hmm. uh, and to organize them politically on that basis. It is very and, corrosive. And so when somebody like Coleman comes out, who has all the card, he could play all the cards that he wants, and says, "No, I'm not going to play the cards. It's I'm going to play these cards." Uh, that is a yep. that is a bigger threat than Richard Spencer to them because he's showing he's showing people he's showing his group that there's uh that there's just as much social capital coming out against this stuff and mm. and plus you get to think on your own instead of towing this party line if you if you reject it um so it, it seems like the uh the the heat and the hate that he gets is uh, kind of, uh, it's it 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 shows just how powerful his thoughts are because it, how disruptive and how how truly uh, you know revolutionary like his path is as opposed to the nominally revolutionary uh, give up your individuality to to gain a bunch of emotion. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah. I, I'm being pretty pretty negative well, towards him. But. Um, part of something that. I People like him and, and John McWhorter and um, Glenn Lowry and, and, and people who have similar takes on race have always mentioned is that within the black community itself, when you look at survey data, they are actually very diverse ideologically hmm. in a way that is not accounted for by the intersectional orthodoxy. 
So um, something to the effect of 50% of, of African Americans describe themselves as conservative. Mm -hmm. um, very few are Republicans because the Republican Party um, mm -hmm. has very bad brand name, justifiably in my view, but it's a different mm -hmm. topic. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but nonetheless, when it comes to a more philosophical identification, they identify as conservative. And, and I mean, again, this is something that cannot be accounted for by the intersectional frame of, uh, of thought. Mm -hmm. And what about the Hispanic community? Are you willing to speak about that community? You... Yeah. Uh, um, so I'm, I'm Hispanic. I was born in Venezuela. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. And, but, uh, and you're in Florida, too, which has a pretty large Hispanic voting bloc yes mainly mainly conservative cubans um <laughs> which is mo how most of my friends not conservative but cuban um there are very few conservatives my age <laughs> uh, but um sorry so uh, also among hispanics there is also a similar effect where uh i forget the number exactly i think it's somewhere in the 40s but i might be wrong identifies conservative a big chunk identifies as moderate, and then some identify as liberal. Uh, but but there is a big, bigger split with Republican Democrat. So there are more conserv self-identified conservative Hispanics than Republican Hispanics. Okay. Uh, but again, like, uh, well, the thing is also the Hispanic community, even within itself, has yeah. has a lot of diversity yeah. racially, economically, geographically. So so it, it's pull, pulling together everybody who speaks Spanish also reduces some of all, all the you know what i mean all, all the differences within the community itself it, it seems that the hispanic community is often l left out of the intersectional anti-intersectional debate it usually goes down to black and white on the national level and, yeah. and it seems that the hispanic community is very often overlooked um i, I wonder for a variety of reasons but um that always seems like would that make the debate is that like the third party in this debate you know like the ralph nader comes in and upsets the whole conversation by you know throwing this black versus white dynamic out of uh i, I wonder what what's your perspective on on that on the hispanic involvement in in the intersectional debate uh does it mm. is it used is that uh i guess it's not even an ethnicity it's not a race right it's more of a, yeah. a conglomerate so it it's so porous itself that it doesn't even fit into that intersectional category to begin with yeah uh, it's complicated i'm not sure how they well i think understandably the white black uh distinction gets more uh more press time just because of the history yeah. um there was not hispanic slavery uh, and or hispanic jim crow um so, so I understand why that happens, but uh, Hispanics are, it, it's an interesting, there are, there are a fair number of um, intersectional theorists and activists who are Hispanic, but I suspect that their views are way to the left of your average, of your median Hispanic hmm. in America, um, because Hispanics, uh, this is contentious, but at least dispositionally tend to have a pretty conservative um, worldview mm -hmm. that doesn't necessarily translate into again voting for Republicans, but yes. Hispanics have traditional notions of gender roles. Yeah. Uh, they're very religious, often uh, very pro-Catholic Church, um, hmm. pro you know nuclear family, which intersectional theorists would de deride as uh, heteronormative. Hmm. Um, so I, I don't think. The, the Hispanic population by and large would ever be supportive of any intersectional project or anything like that. But what do, but, what do you what do you think that, about the rebranding re of the Hispanics as Latinx? That seems like this very Anglo-centric, uh, like we're gonna go through and change your culture for you because it's. Yeah, I think it's it's really ridiculous. Um, the, is it taking on or? Uh not. Among activist groups and circles, yes. Um, among like average Hispanics, no. Um, like nobody in my family has heard of <laughs> of it <laughs> unless I've mentioned it, for example. But um, hmm. I mean, yeah, it it, clear, it shows clear signs of having been invented by someone who doesn't speak Spanish because <laughs> no 
word in Spanish that I know of uses the X in that way. Huh. Um, there are the X is very rarely used to begin with, but when it is used, it, it doesn't. It, it often sounds like a J, like in Mexico. Oh yeah, um, yeah. Right, but but not like that. And um, I, what I've seen uh, in some Latin American countries, especially those with a left-wing government, um, there are they say Latino or Latina, so O A to include both oh, genders. Yeah, yeah. So I, I'm not. I don't object to that. I think that's fine. Um, but but yeah, the I'm very averse to the Latinx hmm. description. And so um, you're going back to Colombia with are Coleman is one year behind you. I think he's a. Are you guys no, both he, in the same year? We're both in the same. He's a few years older than me, just because. Of out age. of college. He, yeah. Well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, out of college, he had to do some things, but uh, but we're in the same year, so we'll, we still have two more years there to cause trouble. Have you guys spoken about the potential blowback? It seems like it's been a very busy summer for both of you guys, and it seems you guys are both pretty uh, pretty much rock stars now on the <laughs> uh, on the internet uh, stage, writing for Quillette and stuff. And I'm sure, and it seems like from listening to both of you guys that Columbia is rather leftist or lefty. Mm -hmm. So, do you guys expect some blowback? Do you expect some blowback personally, or do you think uh, nobody's aware? Probably not, <laughs> for a few reasons. So, he and I both suspect, and we don't have like survey data to prove this, but we suspect that most people at Columbia aren't social justice activists. <laughs> uh, my sense is that most people in college are, you know, generally liberal but not all the way out on the intersectional left. And, and um, but, you know, it's very, it's pretty difficult for both of us actually uh, to publish things in the newspaper at Columbia. Oh yeah? Yeah, because there's so much resistance, not among the whole student body, but among a small section of it that Who, is very hostile to. And they control the means of yeah, there, yeah, a few a few years ago, someone, um, uh, a woman published an article on the newspaper that was sort of articulating a colorblind vision of race. Um, there's a whole controversy, but in short, uh, she got so much hate. The whole school was, it erupted. Huh. <laughs> um, the whole school was talking about it, and the newspaper decided from then on pretty much never to publish anything that is not far left on race so if and, and you don't have to take my word for it if you go look at the opinion uh, page at the columbia newspaper uh there's a lot of stuff on race but it's always very intersectional and very far left you won't hmm. you won't even get a centrist perspective hmm. um but yeah, I don't. I don't think people will be throwing bricks through our windows or anything. Oh like yeah, that. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I just. I, I wonder. I wonder about the climate. I wonder if because it seems like you guys are both phenomenal. You're both phenomenal communicators, uh, and even if you don't get play in the Columbia newspaper, it seems like you guys have the potential of of starting up like kind of. Uh, not not a counter revolution, but <laughs> people just actually having conversations about this stuff that doesn't end up being pegged as as left or or anti um, anti conservative. I, I would hope so. I, I hope so. I, I think there is there is a demand for it that is at, at at the school that is difficult to satisfy because of the of a small number of people who just. Hmm. have an incredible sway over what everybody else can think and say hmm. Hmm. well i i want to encourage you both or you specifically to give them hell <laughs> they deserve it <laughs> well we're, we're trying but um i don't know how how many people at columbia read colette but we're trying i don't know colette's <laughs> taken off but a national re review is pretty national yeah uh Again, at Columbia, I'm not so sure, but <laughs> <laughs> but but there's hope. There's I think there is hope, and um, like I said, I think the intellectual dark web is a, is a sign uh, of hope that these conversations can take place. Yeah, no, I think people are are, are, are thirsting for it. Uh, it's not every you know, it's not every era that a uh, academics are filling up stadiums, and we're kind of in that <laughs> era for for better or worse. So it's yeah, upon it's us. Incredible sight to behold, uh, <laughs> seeing, yeah, 
two PhDs arguing about truth uh, filling up a, a stadium. Yeah, in uh, Vancouver and then again in yeah. British Columbia, like multiple nights too. Right, it's crazy. That's um, insane. They're rock stars. But yeah. I would like to see one of them debate an intersectional theorist, I think, or, or, or someone who has very progressive takes on, on race and gender. I think that'd be good. I, yeah, I wonder. I wonder if it's it's possible without it devolving into name calling, like that uh, that monk debate with Peterson and another guy, and the the other guy right. was just just kind Angry of white man. Yeah. throwing a wrench in the whole in the whole work. So I wonder if. I wonder if it's possible, um, and I wonder if it ha- doesn't happen because of the shakiness of the ideas under certain sorts of uh, argumentative lights. But um, I, I guess I should put my money where my mouth is and actually uh, debate or actually uh, speak with more progressives on my channel. But I'm into signal boosting people who <laughs> are in your camp. <laughs> yeah, I understand. I understand the the impulse. I also don't know that many who would be willing uh, to do it, but. Hmm. Uh, there was, I mean, Jordan Peterson has debated, uh, there was, there's a debate of him in Canada at, at a university, I forget which, and I mean, these debates are really difficult. He debated a, a gender studies professor hmm. who accused him essentially of being a, a, no better than a eugenicist. <laughs> she said that she was ashamed to have appeared um, in uh, to share a platform with him because of, uh, of how horrible his views were. Um, on another occasion, Jordan Peterson also was uh, on Canadian TV and, and he was accused of committing a hate crime. Mm-hmm. Um, I like to think that not all intersectional theorists are like this. And mm-hmm. in fact, um, I have read some intersectional theorists critique the conservative view of race in a in a and also the liberal like not far left liberal just mainstream liberal view of race in a very fair way that hmm. fairly represented their arguments um and i'm and so so it they, there that does exist and and i would really like to see more of an exchange between them hmm. Hmm. yeah i wonder if uh i wonder if we can all collectively push debate public discourse in a direction where those that kind of uh, discussion can have because i'm sure that intersectionality beyond its addictiveness and its appeal to certain sorts of psychological types and psychological psychological states uh i'm sure it does have things to offer us um to to uh enable us to refine uh Mm you know the the very complex system of you know that we're a part of in this day and age um yeah. but it, it's interesting to see like reading your your arguments and hearing your arguments to see the problems with it and and like my my problem with it uh how it's being weaponized and using uh being used to demonetize and and strip people of their agency mm. and their individualism uh is some big problems but i'm sure beyond that there's something in it yeah, I, um, I actually, you know, give the give the devil credit uh, when it's due, right? But um, I have I have reading and engaging with them, not personally um, at Columbia. I haven't yet found uh, any intersectional activist who is willing to. But but reading sort of the professors and stuff, and listening to them, they they do have some genuine insight. Uh, I, I think not frequently maybe but but they do uh um, offer insight so to give one example um tony morrison who is a a fiction writer um renowned fiction writer um was interviewed on charlie rose uh uh, some years ago and charlie rose asked her uh she's also very involved in the critical race theory and intersectional thought etc and charlie rose asked her um are you ever going to write a book that's not about race and she said, I don't understand your question because just because my books are about black people doesn't mean they're about race. Uh, mm. Author writes a book about white people. They're not asked if they're going to continue to write about race. So why is it that only black people writing about black characters mm. are considered to be writing about race? And, and I thought that, that was a, a good point that that's not a safe assumption to make. I think if he had asked her, are you ever going to write a book and i think she has that's not about race relations yeah so um it's different you could uh you know 
there is a difference between writing about the way blacks and whites interact with each other than writing a book where the characters are black yeah. and people don't really play. So yeah, they, I, I do think there, there is genuine insight in it and it, and everybody would benefit from engaging. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, it seems like when, when they do do good, it's to push the conversation just a little bit further to reconsider. Yes. Formulas, reconsider older formulas. Uh, but it seems like the, the, beyond that, Beyond changing words, like I, I, I've, I, I'm, there's a dearth of evidence of it being anything other than rhetoric. Um, so I wonder how it's going to spill out into actual praxis, um, and if that praxis is going to be beneficial for society as a whole, or just uplift, which is fine to just up uplift people who are downtrodden. Um, but I wonder. <laughs> 